Good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Kathleen Scott, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the 54th Annual Geology Museum Open House. I'd like to thank our sponsors for this open house, the Rutgers School of Arts and Sciences, the Rutgers Science Explorer, the Friends of the Geology Museum, and the Institute for Earth, Ocean, and Atmospheric Sciences. This is a very special open house for us because it marks the beginning of our 150th anniversary year. Okay, the museum was founded in 1872, so it's 150 years. And all of our activities this morning and throughout the day will, will be organized around that theme our history and the importance of natural history and geology museums for all of us. I'd like to review a little bit what's going to happen today. We have four lectures for you today. Our first will start in a few minutes at 10 o'clock, Curating a Culture of Curiosity, Strategies for Managing a Natural History Museum in the Deep South. Our 11.30 talk, the 19th Century Geology and the Creation of America's First Geology Museum, which of course is us. At one o'clock, why Mary Anning rocks? And at 2.30, a scientific and architectural history of the Geology Museum. Following on our anniversary theme, we'll have children's activities built around some of our most popular exhibits. At 10.30 a.m., paper plate spider crabs. And at 11.30, mummy madness. So I hope you're, if you have children, they will join us for those activities. Our online mineral sale is opening now, and it will be open till 8 p.m. on Facebook. You can use the QR code there to scan, and it will take you there. And I hope you will visit. We have some lovely things on offer this time. And I hope you'll be with us for, throughout the year for our continuing virtual museum programs. We have mineral patch programs, geology merit badge programs, paint along events, our popular Ask a Geologist series, and late nights. We will also be open to the public starting this coming week, if all goes well, on Thursdays and Fridays. And I ask you please to check our website for that. I wanna thank all of you for your support, especially through these difficult last few years that have forced us mostly to go remote and I hope that you will continue to support us. If it's possible, I'd like to urge you to become a member. We have different levels of membership and we have some lovely new merchandise following, um, which will feature our beautiful 150th anniversary logo. And some of that merchandise, we have hats, stickers, and tote bags will also be available for online ordering soon. So I hope you will continue to support us in many ways. All right, I am pleased to now move directly to our first talk and to introduce our speaker. Our first talk is going to be Curating a Culture of Curiosity, Strategies for Managing a Natural History Museum in the Deep South. And our speaker is Amy Mo Hoffman, who's an instructor of geology at Mississippi State University and chair of the University Museums and Gallery Committees and curator at the Dunseiler Museum. She received her bachelor's degree at Gustavus Adolphus College studying quaternary geology and later went on to earn a master's degree in museum and field studies with a focus in paleontology and natural history collections at the University of Colorado at Boulder. Previously, she served as collections managers for the Paleontological Research Institution and the Invertebrate Paleontology Collection Manager for the University of Colorado Museum of Natural History. Her research interests include using fossil insects to determine paleoclimates and paleoenvironments, as well as the conservation and management of natural history collections. So now I'd like to turn it over to Amy. Hi, thank you for that introduction. I'm going to pull up my um, my slides here. Um, congratulations too on 150 years. What a great um, and exciting milestone for all of you. Um, that's just really, really great. Uh, 
This is just going to take a second. Sorry, the screen changed when you sent it over to me. So <laughs> I was thrown a little bit. Okay, can you see my slides? Any hands up there? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Good. I'm going to do this then. All right, so um, this morning I want to talk a little bit. I'm going to start out with the importance of collections and how they really give context to Excuse our me, lives. I just want to let you know you're in like presenter mode so we can see the couple of different boxes. Oh, excuse me. Cool. Let me escape from that. So right now you can only see. It, um, there's, a, there's a way you can swap your displays once you're in the presentation. Okay, let me do this. Displays. Um, I think it's up at the top, maybe the zoom bar is blocking. Yep, there it is. Okay, so just. Um, Swap. Yep. There you go. There we go. Thank you for telling me. <laughs> no problem. No problem. Um, okay. So, uh, like I said, I was going to start out with a little bit about the importance of collections, um, move into some of the challenges with organizing a collection and making sure that you're, you're reaching all of the dif different audiences, and then move into some specific ways that the Dunn-Siler has been doing outreach and trying to engage audiences using our collections. And so I wanted to start out um, and just have all of you reflect a little bit on something that you collect. So I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one in the room who collects things um, and finds value in objects and the stories that they tell. So as I'm talking, really think about your collections and uh, whether they're personal or professional and then reflect on why it is you collect those things. Um, and in the meantime, you know, the slide says humans are collecting, but of course there are other things in the biosphere that collect as well. And so I wanted to just focus on a couple of those fun stories to start out. One is the silky bowerbird, who is a resident of Australia. And the male bowerbird creates these really beautiful architectural wonders um, out of sticks and, and needles and grasses and things to intrigue females. And after this, this bower that he creates is made, he'll go out into the, into the environment and collect things that are specifically blue to adorn the bower. And so in an urban area, of course, this turns into lots of pieces of plastic and lids and things. But in a, in a non-urban environment, this ends up being flowers that are blue and berries, and they actually hang them in the bowers. And it's really beautiful. And as I was um, looking into this a little bit more for the talk, um, there's some recent research that kind of indicate or that seems to indicate that the the there's an inverse relationship between the color of the male's plumage and the number of blue items that he collects. So the less blue his feathers, the more he compensates by gathering blue items, which my kids both thought was was really cool. Another really cool example of this that actually ties into human collecting and, and um, paleontological collecting are these harvester ants that live in the western part of the United States. And what they do is they go out and specifically look for a certain grain size that's larger than what the nest is actually made out of, um, usually about two to four millimeters. And they, they gather these larger grains and they're usually grains that are highly reflective as well. And they line the top of their nest with those grains. And there's a purpose to this type of collecting. It's that um, the reflective grains actually reflect and deflect the heat of the sun away from the nest. And then the size of grain allows more air to pass through. So in these desert environments, it helps to cool the nest and keep the, the colony healthy. Um, and so the nest that you see here, actually, um, the ants have gone out and collected specifically little pieces of obsidian. And it when I got the, the picture here, it said that the closest source of that obsidian was over 100 meters away from this nest. So the creatures are... Uh, the ants are going out for long, long distances and specifically looking for these, these things to collect and help them keep their nest healthy. Now, the human aspect of this is that since the late 1800s, paleontologists realized that the, the class size of, of sediment that these ants were collecting corresponded to the size of a lot of the mammal fossil mammal teeth that they were looking for. And so, um, you know, of course, you would want the ants to do your work for you if possible. So <laughs> the, the paleontologists would collect 
directly off of the nest so they wouldn't have to crawl around on hands and knees to find individual uh, minuscule pieces of, of mammal teeth. But if you do this, it's very important when you wanna keep the ant colony healthy. Um, so you can't collect more than, than say a quarter of the sediment off of the entire surface. You have to give them a chance to regenerate. And then the other thing is that these ants bite really hard. So you wanna make sure that if you're collecting in this way, um, you collect in the very, the, at the time when they're not really active, which is in the heat of the midday sun. So just a couple of fun collecting stories that are non-human as you were kind of reflecting on the reasons that you might have collections of your own. Um, so really collections represent uh, their objects and each object has a, a story and a history that's associated with it. And so some of the collections really are, are based in necessity, um, but a lot of them, um, personal collections especially maybe, are based in sentimentality and nostalgia. Sometimes we collect purely for aesthetics, things that we think are beautiful, like the beautiful um, minerals that I saw you had for sale and fossils um, to, to support the museum. Also, we can't forget that collecting offers us a sense of community. So if there's something that you are collecting or that is part of your professional collection, um, there's a huge community around that. You're not the only one that's collecting that object. And so, so um, it brings people together. And then of course, too, our natural history collections and, and other collections and museums, um, there's this need to, to preserve history and the stories that the objects have to tell. And of course, the, the scientific discovery that goes along with a collection, the research um, to better understand our past and to um, project into the future um, this, this uh, about the world around us. And then lastly, the importance of that thrill of discovery. So there's a little bit of adrenaline that goes along with finding an object or something that you've been looking for for a long time or something that's particularly rare, um, something that has value, whether that's educational value or um, you know, academic value or monetary value. There's a thrill that goes along with that. And for many years, museums were, were very elite and collections were elite. And it was, it was a thrill that was reserved for those elite peoples. And so what we, what we look for now is to bring that thrill to the general public, to our students, and, and to everyone. So that wall of kind of mystery is gone and it, that thrill then excites them to learn more and, and sparks creativity and curiosity surrounding the objects so that those stories that they have to tell aren't lost forever. So one thing that I did recently, we have a freshman class here at Mississippi State um, that's just a survey of all of the different museums and collections we have on campus. And um, we have about 30 of them, if you can believe it. That's quite a, quite a few little tiny satellites. Um, and when they were coming to the museum, they were just getting a tour and we were talking to them about things like museum flow and, and what have you, but I wanted them to do an activity. So I used a collection that is my own personal collection, which is antique buttons that were passed on to me by my grandmothers. And I handed each student as they walked in a bag of buttons. And all I said was organize these. I didn't give them any other instructions at all. And so you can imagine with 25 different students, you had you know, 25 different ways of sorting those buttons. Um, they sorted them by material, they sorted them by color, and they sorted them by the number of holes each button had. Um, but those are all things that are very inherent um, qualities of those buttons. For, you know, if, if you look at a button 50 years from now, you would still be able to tell it had four holes, or you would still be able to tell it was made of wood. Um, but I could further make, you know, split those buttons up into piles based on which grandmother they belong to. That's more latent or hidden data that is associated with the specimen uh, or the button and would be in danger of being lost if it wasn't properly recorded and stored. Um, and you never know when that information might become uh, necessary to tell a part of the story of that specimen. Um, so an example here from the museum in particular is this salt core. This is one of my favorite specimens just because it is so dull and boring. It's literally literally just a tube of salt. Um, and when it was when I first got here, 
the label with it just said salt core, its chemical composition, and that it was from Mississippi. But when you go to the ledger, um, I found that this was actually a salt core that was from the Tatum Salt Dome. And the Tatum Salt Dome has its own whole story that is associated with the specimen. And the story is that um, the Tatum Salt Dome was the site of the only nuclear testing to occur east of the Mississippi River. In the 1960s, there, uh, all of the nations that had nuclear weapons agreed to no longer test weapons in the atmosphere because they started to realize the health effects um, that were occurring. And so no more testing above ground, no more testing in water. Um, but there was no caveat in that partial test ban treaty that, that said, nations couldn't test underground. Um, it was just kind of left out. And so we wanted to test how noticeable it would be if we were testing underground. And so they drilled um, down into the salt core, into the salt dome, and uh, detonated. It ended up being two different nuclear weapons down there. And it turns out that it's very noticeable, <laughs> even at the surface. So residents of this Lamar County area in Mississippi um, had damage to their homes. And in fact, there's one community still in the area who gets water trucked in from outside the area because of uh, fear of contamination of their water source. And so this is a history that was even lost in people, like students that were coming here from Lamar County didn't even know this history. And this little kind of uh, unassuming object opens up a whole door and gives this, this tangible way of telling that story to the students. Uh, that's really a, a vital part of their history. Okay. Um, so museums and collections were really um, getting away from that idea of the elitist and, and hidden stuff and we're, we're really um, starting to understand the importance of inclusivity and the benefits of having diverse voices and, um, and full accessibility to our specimens so that we, we can grow as an institution. And really museums, at least when I'm working with a collection, it's split up into three different types of, of objects or, or collections. There's the research collection, um, which you really want to have every bit of that information associated with the specimen. You don't wanna lose any data points at all um, because you'd never know when something is going to be critical to understanding the context of that specimen in the, in the realm of research. Um, public outreach, that would include things like exhibits and outreach specimens, touchable specimens. Those are typically things, they may have all of the data points associated with them, but a lot of times you want to make sure that they're very showy and they're things that um, demonstrate exactly what you, story you want to tell. And then educational specimens, um, those I, re I refer to as education specimens because we're using them specifically in our upper level and undergraduate courses to, uh, as examples for things that we wanna teach the students about. But let's move now um, into talking more about the Dunn-Seiler Museum in particular. Um, Dunn-Seiler Museum is at Mississippi State University. This is one of my absolute favorite pictures here of the students looking through the Triceratops skull. Um, but our museum was founded in 1946. It was the Department of Geology at the time. Um, it was founded by Dr. Paul Dunn, who was our department head. And the name Seiler comes from Frank Seiler, who was a former student, um, then turned instructor in our department, who was deployed to the European um, stage in, the, in World War II. Um, and he lost his life in battle. And so we wanted to, he wanted to honor his service to the country, but also his service to the department. And in so doing, um, he added his name to the museum. Initially, the museum specimens, um, our, our paleontological and geologic specimens were um, his research collection, as well as collections that were made by our students all across the, all across the Mississippi um, landscape. And so a lot of them are coming from places that are no longer collectible. Um, so that's, that's really exciting. We have about 50,000 fossils and not included on there about 30,000 um, rock and mineral specimens as well. And we are a research one institution. So with, with holotypes. Um, so when I got here, I really thought that I was going to be managing this collection primarily as a research collection with these hundreds of holotypes and, you know, fulfilling loans and 
and it turned out to not be the case at all. Uh, we have an education collection for the classroom and we have public display space, but only about 500 square feet right now. Uh, that has been whittled down and whittled down. That's only about a quarter of what we had decades ago. Um, and then outreach, we do outreach, of course. But what I found when I first got here, that the state of the collections, it was largely stored in various places around campus and it was completely inaccessible. Um, and so really what this, this showed me was that our collection was in danger. It was in peril. Um, and, and could easily be lost if, if we didn't work hard to stop that. So um, Starkville, Mississippi is kind of in central Mississippi on the east side, uh, what most people would refer to as the deep south, although locals here say and are very adamant that it is the mid-south, so make sure uh, to, to note that. This is a five hour drive radius around our town and our university. And these little dots represent some natural history museums in the area. Um, and so you can pretty easily see that we are in the middle of, of somewhat of a museum desert in this area. And what this represents to me is an opportunity to reach out to a lot of people who wouldn't otherwise have an opportunity to, to see these natural history collections and museums, um, but also an obligation to, to make sure that we are, we are um, available to, to teach scientific thought and, and scientific inquiry in this region. Um, of course, I think also you are probably familiar with the fact that Mississippi is pretty squarely in the Bible Belt. And according to the World Population Review, 77% of adults here self-identify as being highly religious. And um, just an aside to the K through 12 curriculum for science allows creationism to be taught alongside evolution in the classroom. I also went down this big rabbit hole when I was doing the research here of um, uh, looking at, at some census data that compared our county, Octavia County with Middlesex County, um, which is where Rutgers is, and then along with two other places where I worked. Um, this is just a bunch of, of gobbledygook but uh, to look at, but the things that I wanted to highlight were one, our population here is in extreme poverty. 23.5% of our residents live in below the poverty level. Um, but despite that, um, the numbers on the bottom there, um, our education level in the county is very comparable to that of Middlesex County where, where you all are. And so um, I found that interesting. And then you can also see the number at the very top that I put in red, 76.4% of our households have internet. So that's actually a very low number. So you can imagine this posed some, some difficulty with uh, remote learning in the, in, during the pandemic, but also our outreach activities that had to go online um, made it a little bit more challenging. So all of this to say, you know, uh, that there was very much when I got here an urgent need to increase the use of our collections on all levels through research and, and outreach and, and education, and also then increase the visibility or like what I like to say is the notoriety of our museum. Um, because the collections were in peril, our museum was in peril. And having come from the Paleontological Research Institution, part of our mission there was to take on orphaned collections. And you know, you'd get calls all times of the day, all throughout the year, saying, oh, such and such university just put their entire collection in the dumpster and it needs to be, it needs to be retrieved right away. Um, and that's because the the administration oftentimes will will view a collection as a drain on resources rather than an opportunity to increase resources and so um, when I got here I was really afraid that this might happen if we didn't work hard to um, to become more more um, visible in the community so that if we disappeared people would notice and people would would you know not be happy about that so we needed to demonstrate, um, the utility of our collections and become really the goal was to become a hub of culture and scientific inquiry in the region. So the triage was um, all of our specimens, like I said, all across campus, but they were in these open boxes um, in areas that everybody had a key to 
um, students and faculty alike. And so there was a lot of high grading going on. They could just look in a box, see something they liked, pick it out, and it would be gone forever. Um, so first and foremost, getting those specimens in a secure area and improving the storage, um, and then tracking and digitizing. Um, also getting them all in one building helped um, and move them into boxes that are labeled with lids. So it's just that much harder to grab things out. <laughs> um, uh, our education collection, we have a really great education collection, but it had not been tracked at all and was also very high graded. So I made a lot of friends with the faculty by right away making a collections policy and then going office to office and taking back all of the things that they'd squirreled away in there and put into this into use this tracking system so that we could um, see what was being used and by whom. And then um, our displays when we got here were very much set up in that idea of elitism. You can see our cases were just chock full of specimens and the labels had um, only the genus species name of each, of each specimen, not anything, uh, no more context than that. And so you can imagine those people who were coming to our museum for tours were mostly K through 12 students at the time. And that doesn't speak to them at all. It barely speaks to me. <laughs> so we needed to improve those exhibits and um, increase hours of operation to reach a broader, a broader audience. Okay, so it's been well established that museums are important centers of learning for all ages. And this, this really gives um, uh, our museums and our collections give an opportunity to a wide audience to um, really experience that thrill of discovery I was talking about if you do it right. Um, so this informal learning center is, is uh, a good place for us to achieve um, learning outcomes. And the learning outcomes that we're focusing on here are really these big ideas of earth science literacy that were put out by the earth science literacy initiative in 2010. And so they're all listed here, but you can, you can see that really none of them say that we need our, our, our population to know the genus and species names of fossils. We need to bring in these bigger ideas about earth science and really make people become more, more curious about the world around them. And then hopefully um, more active participants and more uh, globally thinking citizens, right? More thinking about the earth as a system. And so um, that is just going from uh, a design concept to now we're, we're actively trying to implement some more interesting and interactive designs in, in our exhibitry. Um, but one of the challenges here, of course, being in the Bible Belt is, is that you want to respect the audience as well. So people have been brought up in the church and, and told a certain thing. And when they come to the museum, they might be told something um, that doesn't exactly align with what they've been told before. And, and I've also learned living in the South for a long time that people do not like confrontation here. So it might be surprising, but I get a lot less confrontation um, in tours here than I ever had in, in uh, New York or in Colorado. Um, people who feel confronted here just shut down and don't listen and don't respond. And so we don't want to be combative or, or um, aggressive in any way in our language. So we, we make simple changes, like instead of using the word evolution, uh, we'll use the word change, change through time. Um, evolution, no way that that turns everybody off and the the point isn't to turn them off it's to keep them engaged and keep them learning so they become more curious um and so then another thing that our director dr clary has implemented is that our web interface as well as the welcome center make it clear when someone is is um uh, scheduling a tour that they're going to be learning that the earth is old, 4.6 billion years old, and that the fossils they may be collecting are going to be 70 million years old. Um, so that being told on the front end gives them the freedom to choose whether or not to schedule the tour. And more often than not, people continue to schedule a tour. Um, it's very rare that we have someone cancel because of that. But then they're given the option, right? So now just I'm moving into a couple of examples of things that we do here at the museum. And I, I realized after putting this together that a lot of these aren't going to have specimens or collections involved in the photos because that's where I come in and, I'm, and I never think to take pictures of it. So, <laughs> um, so if you don't see 
um, specimens just know they're around, they're just not in the pictures necessarily. Um, but one of the, my big things is collaboration. I'm kind of a generalist. I like to, I like to bring people in across disciplines. And I really think that that was going to be the way that would get uh, notoriety for our Dunn-Seiler Museum is by working with these other entities around campus and off campus to collaborate for things and, and bring attention to the space itself. And so um, our old drawers, you can see on the right there, they were put into this really cool um, public art display in landscape architecture department. And then we brought, uh, Dr. Cleary brought in an artist from the art department who was working with, with two students who wanted to do pub art in public spaces. And they created this great mural about the Cretaceous of um, Mississippi in our museum and really brought a lot of color to it. Um, when I first got here, I worked with the biology department as well to design this week long series of event called Darwin Week. And one of the things we did there was I reached out to eighth grade teachers in our public schools and asked if they wanted to bring students to campus. And they did, this, this particular teacher did, and we worked really hard to set up all of these stations on campus throughout the day where the students would go from one to one and, and get hands-on experience and activities here on campus. Now, the outcome of this, one of them, I guess both of them were really surprising. One is that it turns out that even though our town is relatively small, it's about 40, 30 to 40,000 people, uh, a large percentage of these eighth graders had never set foot on campus. They never felt welcome here. They never felt invited here uh, or like it was a place for them to be. And so this got them onto campus for the first time ever at that age. And then the other thing was the teacher reported after the fact that there was a much higher percentage of participation in the eighth grade science fair than had ever happened before in his tenure at the school. So that was also very exciting and promising. And there were lots of challenges with doing this, especially because it happened during the weekday during school time. Um, so we morphed this into something called Science Night at the Museums. And now this is something that happens once a year. Uh, we get about 2,500 visitors in just a two hour span of time. So you can see that really demonstrates the hunger and interest level that people in our community have for events like this and to become a hub like I was talking about. Um, and these visitors were coming from even over an hour away sometimes. Um, lots of faculty and student buy-in that we had never had before as well. So lots of participation on the faculty level and it really did reach a broad audience. And so we do this every year now. Um, we also, through the Museums and Galleries Committee, do these cross-disciplinary cross exhibits at least once a year, maybe twice, um, where we all bring objects together around a central theme and um, display them on, on campus here for people to enjoy and to raise awareness of the different museums on campus. Um, Dr. Clary has implemented some art competitions that revolve around National Fossil Day and Earth, Earth Day in the spring, um, one in the fall, one in the spring, and we get some really, really fun um, submissions for that. This now has become an online thing since the pandemic. So we're getting we're getting applications and submissions from all, all across the country now, which is even more exciting. Um, Dr. Clary also implemented um, these our tours when students come to the museum. Part of the tour includes an outcrop excursion. So um, kids get to, to collect their own fossils, have them identified, they learn about um, uh, uh, the end of the Cretaceous, and then they get to keep those fossils when they go home and they get muddy. So they get, they love that. Now, really big is that in the last two years, um, the university and the community have developed a partnership school, which is a lab school where our university students can, education students can learn about teaching in real time in the classroom here on campus at the school. Um, but as a lab school, usually they are things that students have to apply for and they're very elite. elite. Um, but this lab school will, it includes all of our public school children in sixth and seventh grade. So every single sixth and seventh grader in our county who attends public school gets to come to school on campus for, for those two years. And we do a lot of outreach with um, museums and galleries through, through that as well and, and activities with that school. It's very exciting. 
And then of course we travel to partner events. I'm gonna, I'm kind of running late here. Um, some are off campus, some are on. This Mississippi State Insect Fair is really, really fun. They bring in hundreds of fourth graders um, from local, um, local native reservations. So the Choctaw and Chickasaw nations. And it is just so much fun. It's just, a, I like insects anyway, but it's a really fun day. So really all of these things, and I, I had to really pick and choose a couple of them, they're momentum for change. And they're demonstrating the value of the collections and increasing the visibility of the museum to make us a place that um, is, is integral to the community, to make us, um, like I said, if we were to disappear, people would notice and people would be upset. So we wanted to make sure we got that momentum going. And since uh, we've really pushed all of this, uh, we've increased visitorship, we've increased, importantly, collections-based research and museum education research, um, both internally and externally, you know, people getting loans from us, as well as our own students studying what we have. We've increased community engagement and increased collaborative programming with internal and external partners. We've increased our funding and um, donations to the museum. And most importantly, uh, and most recently, we have caught the eye of the upper administration to the point where they are actually talking about the possibility of a more centralized um, cross-disciplinary museum and, and kind of like a museum campus on our campus. So um, that's really exciting. And it means that what we're doing is starting to work after almost 12, 12 or 13 years of, of working toward this goal. Um, so really these objects have the ability to to tell stories and and then we have the responsibility to bring these stories to everybody and make sure that they're here in perpetuity for people to enjoy and for us to to gain context about the world around us and i think that was my last slide it is and i thank you all so much for having me i'm sorry if i went over a little bit um but i'm open to any questions that there might be this was wonderful. Thank you. I, I really enjoyed hearing your talk. Um, if you'd like, you can stop sharing your slides so we can see you a little bit okay. better. Um, but while you're doing that, can you tell us where we can find more information about your museum? Absolutely. We have a website that I had on the last slide there. Um, it is www.museums dot msstate.edu that's the quickest way to get to that is actually the museums and galleries consortium and that's the quickest way to get to more information about events that we're holding and then you can specifically reach our museum through there as well great thank you mm -hmm. I, I will be checking it out so <laughs> um so we have a couple questions that have come in and if anybody has any other questions please put them in the chat um our helpers and workers are putting them onto a document for me to read. Um, but we have a few so far. Uh, first one is what do you like to collect? What do I like to collect? A good good question. I have a, a lot of little personal collections. Of course, you saw my button collection, but um, I have a lot of uh, marbles as well. I, I try not to collect too many natural history things because I see it as a little bit of a conflict of interest sometimes. But um, I do, of course, have a rock and mineral and fossil collection too. <laughs> but yes, as as we all have our own fossils, it's yeah. hard not collect them, right? When you're yeah. surrounded by them. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, so, what are some of the benefits of inclusivity, inclusivity, and diversity in museum collections? Well, um, so there there are kind of two layers to that. I think there's the the diversity of the collection itself. And, and I was going to talk a little bit about bias and collections, but you can imagine that anything that comes into the collection is kind of seen through the lens of the collector, right? And so it might be, you know, what they're specifically interested in, what they had access to, um, but it also might, you know, it can reflect an individual. Um, so you kind of have to be careful and make sure that your collections policy is is um, diver, you know allows for diversity of of collectors, um, and then you, that you're being um, aware of the biases as a curator and what stories you're projecting and telling with the items themselves. So um, you want 
and then and then there's the the diversity of your audience. You want to make sure to generate interest among a broad audience because um, you know the way that one person views or one one community views the the natural world or the earth is completely different than than how uh, I might view it. Um, there's there's a cultural. Um, Everybody has a cultural view of of their their world, their space, and you know we come from things from a, a sort of Western notion of viewing the world, and there are whole other there are lots of other cultures that view the world in a completely different way, and so if we quiet that, we're really only promoting our own view of the world, and so this diversity is really important for us to understand uh, and and have empathy for other people, and other peoples. Great, that's very, very eye opening to think about. <laughs> um, so how did your museum adapt to the pandemic closure? So what kind of remote programs were you doing? Um, that's, that's a good question. We ended up and and I think um, that 76.4% of households having the internet was really eye opening to me in in when I was doing this talk. Um, because it made me realize how many people we were still forced to cut off from from programming um, in our area. But we had, um, let's see, for National Fossil Day, we continued to have our art thing, our art competition online. And then uh, last year, we did a whole series of, of talks kind of like this, um, that were very short little snippet interviews from paleontologists around the country, um, really talking about how they became paleontologists and what led them to be interested in it and the path that they that they took to get there, trying to um, uh, I guess open open that door for someone who might be watching who just has no where, no idea where to start. Um, and then this year we did something different because we were kind of all back on campus. Uh, our faculty and staff and students chose some of the items and objects in the museum that they found exciting and got to you know hold them and talk about them and, and say why they were exciting to them. So and then um, the public got to vote on who um, whose object was their favorite. And so there was a little competition there and it was it ended up being really fun. That's just two examples. So we did everything online um, and we had we had no um, hours of operation over 2020 fall and um, through a lot of 2021. Yes, us too. We, had, we dealt with the same things, but I love that idea of the favorite object and <laughs> competitions. <laughs> it was it was really fun. And I have to say when we came back to campus this fall, um, there was a day that I was working up here in my office and I heard just all of the chatter of, of kids out in the courtyard. And I didn't realize how much I missed it. You know, it was so exciting to think, oh my gosh, someone is coming for an in-person tour for the first time in a year and a half. And it just, it really brought a tear to my eye. I was shocked. <laughs> But it was neat. It's neat. Us at the museum are very familiar with that sound too. We yeah. hear the buses and them coming off the bus. Um, yes. We haven't had a chance to do that yet. So hopefully soon we'll we'll have that sound again. But yes, I completely understand missing yeah. <laughs> that yeah. sound. Um, so what do you think is the best solution to teach people about scientific discovery when they live in like museum deserts where there's not many museums? Well, um, just having the opportunity with these events i think is is the first step so just making it and they will come you know make it and they will come um and that was really demonstrated with science night at the museum and we are going to try to have that this this it's actually next month i'm really curious to see how it goes um so uh the the level uh, or the number of people that came from outside communities was really surprising to me and and exciting um but then we have to be more more um, pointed, I think, in how we do external outreach as well. Um, not just work on those that are close to us, but but um, you know, work with other work with other community partners in the surrounding area, the greater area, to do to do even something as simple as setting up a table and having people bring their fossils in that you can can identify is a way to get people starting starting to be engaged. Um, I can't even say the number of people, there are fossils everywhere here and uh, no rocks, <laughs> but fossils 
Um, and so many people come and they think, oh, I just thought that was something that, you know, lived a couple of years ago. I didn't realize it was even a fossil, you know, just, just being out there and, and showing a few things and talking to people is huge. So we need to get farther out into the community and bring it to them because we don't have the funding and schools don't have the funding to travel here a lot of time. Even lo our local schools don't have the funding to do that. Yeah, we find that too. Um in many places. So I, I question for me, I, you mentioned about doing the, um, the visit to the outcrop. Can you talk a little bit what that outcrop is and what they're finding? That's so cool that you get to do that with students. It is. And we have had to fight tooth and nail to keep that because, you know, where there's a, where there's an outcrop, people want to cover it with uh, trees and cement because <laughs> it's just the way it is. So uh, we have we have secured the place still. They did a bunch of road work over there, but it's a it's a late Cretaceous outcrop. It's marine sediments, so we were underwater during the late Cretaceous um, in in the Mississippi embayment. It's called. Um, so students going out there can find anything from um, like turritella snail stein kerns um, stein kerns for different kinds of clams. We have giant exogyra. Let me just I could grab one. Here's one right here. <laughs> we've got these giant exogyra um yeah, we have those we have those in new jersey too oh that's right you do yeah. <laughs> um so these giant reef building oysters Very and cool. then uh we've had people find shark teeth and even mosasaur vertebra and teeth in this outcrop so there's wow. some really fun things for them to find that that kind of um teach them about the long-term history of the area and the fact and and open their minds to the fact that this wasn't always land that it was underwater and it sounds very like we have a, a location we go to big brook new jersey which um, is a local fossil site and it's a late cretaceous marine section with a lot of the same thing so uh, yeah yeah great <laughs> yeah ours are nice they're in chalk so they're pretty easy to get out and and that like i said no rock that's not true there's chalk but that's the only thing <laughs> cool all right so we have some more from uh, some listeners, um, what do you say is your favorite part of working with the museum? Um, museum work in general is incredibly fun because you never know what you're going to see on any given day. And I got into museums. Um, I had, I've had, I've been blessed with really, really good mentors in the past, but my undergraduate advisor had me working in, in our little museum at Gustavus Adolphus. And there were lots of things. There was a big tornado that came through and we were, I was working on trying to move the specimens and some of the workers that were there helping um, would bring in items. I was the only one there a lot of the time and they bring in these things and say, what is this? What did I find? And I remember uh, being able to identify a, mo a, a mammoth tooth for one of the workers. And he was so excited that thrill of discovery I was telling you about. He was so excited and he made a big thing for his mantle and everything. And I was like, I want to do this for a living. This is really, I want to, I want to bring that excitement to people. And so um, that was kind of the start of it. And I really love that thrill of discovery and bringing it to people. But I also love how maybe someday I have to cut out, <laughs> like the other day, cut out um, pteranodon outlines so that birds don't hit the window. And you know, it's just like a, a wild mixed bag of what you have to do on a day-to-day -day basis. Something we also 100% sympathize with at the museum. <laughs> We've had, we have many stories. We should talk about them someday. <laughs> it's really fun. <laughs> yeah. Uh, someone wants to know, do you plan a major in museum studies? I guess at your, your university. At the institution. Um, there has been talk about at least starting with a certificate in museum studies. And we would be well, um, well set up to do something like that if there was a if there was interest um, at the part of the on the part of the administration, we have a, a presidential library and a gallery of Lincolniana, so um, Abraham Lincoln artifacts that's huge and well known. We have um, anthropology, archaeology museum, our museum, entomology, herbarium, all of these these really cool things, and then of course the whole the art side of it as well. And um, I think we could do a really nice program. Um, but we would have to have buy-in from the administration. So the start of that was that first year experience um, class that I talked about where I had the button, the button activity. Um, we wanted to kind of test the waters and see how, what kind of interest level there was on the part of the students before we tried to grow anything bigger. 
Great. Um, okay, so someone else wants to know, was there an inventory of the original <laughs> original collection? Um, so the inventory that was done, it's just in a very, um, it was just in handwritten ledgers and it was done in a way that was different than I was taught. So everything um, that came in was accessioned, but that was called the catalog number. So we'd have these big groups of items that had a single number um, and sometimes they were all identified and the information was, at, you know, was all there and then sometimes it wasn't so it was it was very messy and i have to admit that a lot of it still is um, there's still a lot of work to be done on parsing that information out but it's been started and everything that's in the ledgers has now been at least put into an a, a spreadsheet format that we can search and um and we've started to recatalog things and use those numbers as accession numbers and stuff so no it was not uh, digitized, but now I would say that there, there's some, um, I can at least search for specimens and find them. Great. That sort of relates to another question someone had. So did, did you design and code your own catalog ledger? Um, so I started out again, when I got here, I thought it was going to be more, um, managing this for research. And so I had designed, uh, a big database in access and it was relational and all this stuff. And then I realized this is this is more than I can do right now. I need to I need to do more triage and get the specimens safe. And so I have moved toward a simple spreadsheet at the moment so that it's so it's not coded. <laughs> it's just a spreadsheet that it was just in the um, and also when I first got here, I was hired as I, I teach, um, as I'm sure most of you do. And so I was supposed to be um, only a half-time employee and then this was on top of everything. So now I'm full-time and only just last year was half of my position moved to curation. So this is uh, fairly new that there's a chunk of my of my work week that is supposed to be devoted to the museum. Great. Uh, let's see. Uh, have you ever had religious visitors who question their beliefs after their interactions with the museum? That's a good question, and I can't say for sure that that's the case. Um, I know I know one thing that I've had to reconcile for a lot of visitors um, in the moment is I think that they they uh, they think that there is um, a disjunct, or you know that you can't be religious and and scientific at the same time, and so. I have talked to people who who were wondering about that and and said, you know, they're not mutually exclusive. You can be a religious person and still be a scientist. Um, and I think that that alone makes them think a little bit more um, about about their place in in that whole context. Um, as far as as deeply questioning and and changing things, I I really don't know. That's that's after the <laughs> interaction at the museum. I haven't had anything in the moment. Um, someone wants to know, do, does the museum offer internships for undergraduates? If so, what kinds? Um, if you are a student here, uh, we would definitely be willing to work with, um, work with you. And I don't, I don't think we've ever had an intern come from outside of the university, um, but we'd be open to anything. There's a lot of, you know, approach me or Dr. Clary, and um, I don't see why we couldn't make that work unless there's some red tape at the university level that I'm not aware of, but I'm, I'm sure we could do something. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of need and a lot of potential projects here. Great. Um, okay, someone wants to know, have you had photo contests and made calendars to sell? <laughs> Um, that's a really good question. I would love to do that. Um, there are rules about us selling things, so we're not allowed to do that. Um, if if we did sell things, all of the money would go to the alumni center, to the you know to the university, and not to the museum itself at this point. Um, but uh, I would love to have a photo competition, and that's a really great idea. Thank you for for mentioning it. <laughs> And I think the last question we have at the moment is someone wants to know, do you make lesson plans to give away to schools? Um, we have in the past, and I would have to look uh, look on our resource page at the at the museum to see how updated it is. Uh, most of the things that we have put together are are um, 
specific to the Mississippi um, science standards. So that might be different from, from state to state. So it's specifically addressing those standards that we have here. And uh, like I said, I'm not sure how up to date those are. I'm not in charge of those, so. Great, well, this has been very interesting. Thank you very, very much for giving us a little glimpse into your museum. Um, and hopefully I'll be able to get down there and see it at some point, <laughs> and see yeah. your collection. So we appreciate you making time for us on, on the Saturday and your day. Yeah um and thank you very much so thank you and um stay safe in all the snow <laughs> yeah, we're all trying to stay warm and dig ourselves out or putting off digging ourselves out by watching and attending these talks so. right. well thanks <laughs> thank you so much have a wonderful day you too thank you bye-bye